strong women leaders and we have worked with them the last eight weeks. They have accomplished so much and uh, we are looking forward to the presentations today. The way that we have structured this session for tonight, I'm going to share, share my screen uh, on a while, in a while and you will see the list of the posters um, and the presenters' names. And then uh, each presenter will have some time to navigate us through the e-poster and then she will accept uh, questions and uh, we'll have a Q&A period. Um, the time will be about eight minutes with, for each one of the posters. So we will make sure that we'll have some time in the end for the reflection towards the end of the session around 5.50. So I really hope we'll respect this time frame so we'll have this uh, time in the end. I'm going to share my screen for now. I hope everyone can see that. Okay. So the first poster ha is titled An Alternative Leadership Perspective Analyzing the Head Winds and Tailwinds for Women Leaders in Finance and Accounting by Shelby Coleman. Navigating Decisions, Outlining the Trajectory of Women's Journey of Self-Discovery as a Non-Traditional Student by Pam Chamberlain. A Voice in the Crowd by Christina Pearson. The Essential Role of Emotional Intelligence, Communication and the Art of Strategies for Female Leaders by Catherine Seema. Rock the Boat, Analyzing Assertiveness as a Woman of Color in Leadership by Jennifer Matthews. And the last presentation is titled Thinking Together, a Virtual Community of Practice Approach to a Graduate Certificate in Women's Leadership Program. It's going to be presented by Dr. Jenny Mitchell. Um, all the facilitators of the Graduate Certificate uh, have been contributed to the content of the presentation of the e-poster. However, Dr. Jenny Mitchell, um, with the beautiful visuals, put everything together and she's going to give the presentation on behalf of the whole team. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen for now and I will turn it to Shelby. Perfect. Thank you, Shelby. Okay. I'm going to give you guys some very obscure scenarios to imagine. I want you to actually picture in your mind what they look like. They might be silly, impossible, or even downright ridiculous, but just go with me. So first, imagine driving down the interstate with the fraction of your car, whether it's the frame and the seats or just the driver's side or even the front end. Probably would look a little silly and not very efficient. Next, imagine being on this Zoom call with only half of a computer. Is it just your keyboard, only your monitor, or is your laptop split right down the middle? Now imagine the last project you work on, whether it be at home or at work, and cut the amount of effort that you put into it, the perspectives and passion by a half, a fourth, or even a fifth. The reason I bring up all of these scenarios is because this is what's happening in the financial sector. Although women are represented in the industry in entry-level roles, the mid-level and director roles, the ones who make those strategic decisions for the organization are dominated by men. So as Lampredi mentioned, I'm Shelby Kuhlman and I work in finance at FCA. So none of this information is new. It's been presented for many years and in many different platforms, but I'm just here to bring awareness to the issue and offer remediation for both women and the leadership team in these organizations. I'm now going to take you through like a guided reading of my poster and follow up with Q&A. However, if you, if you have a question throughout the presentation, feel free to unmute yourself and ask the question drop something in the chat box or even raise your hand, which is a function within Zoom. 
This first column, if it's not zoomed in enough, just speak up and I can zoom in some more, is an introduction to what I previously mentioned. It's specifically related to the financial sector. This chart represents the highest paid CFOs and their corresponding compensation and the revenue that they've managed. The middle column represents the things women in these roles can do to develop their per professional toolbox, as well as the reasons we've justified this phenomenon in the past. And the remediation efforts that organizations can do to help change it. Sorry. And the last column represents a deeper look at myself, my organization, and the things that both you and I can do to improve ourselves and the environments that we work in. This first chart is a glimpse at FCA, the organization that I work in. Um, at the entry level roles, women are represented by 36%. As we continue to go up the, the org chart, you can see that number diminishing. At the director level and above, only 19% or two women are represented at that level. Here are the next steps for you, me, as well as both of us. And lastly, my Clifton Strengths profile. I believe most of the women will discuss this today. However, our journey included an assessment that analyzed uh, how we lead and the strengths that we include most in our daily lives. And my top strengths were analytical, restorative, competition, learner, and focus. I'll now open, up, open it up for questions or if you would like I can zoom in on a different area so you can read some more on that topic. Hi Shelby, will you zoom in on your stereotypes and solutions? Yes. I noticed that your areas have different colors. What do the colors mean? I'm going to zoom out a little bit more, but each of the colors represent a different area where women can 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 work. Also, I also have this chart, which is basically the fundamentals of the graduate certificate in women's leadership. We work through communication, self-awareness, networking, diversity, inclusion, and presence. And each of these colors represent are represented up here. So work-life balance and flexibility are represented in presence. Role models and mentorships are represented in networking and so on. Any other questions? An interesting statistic that I came across while I was doing some of this research is the first time a woman was in the director level role in my organization, which is a multinational company as well as a billion dollar um, organization, is the first time a woman was in a director level role or higher was in 2006, which was not, not very long ago. Shelby, this is Zach. Uh, first of all, yeah, well, first of all, a wonderful job. I, I think the, the presentation was great and uh, I love the poster. 
Um, can you talk to me a little bit about what the biggest takeaway is that you have um, that you have from from your research and from the uh, the consolidation of your poster? And then in the short short term, what you see is the first thing that we at FCA can start addressing and start working with. Sure, so I'll answer the, the main takeaways first. Although there are so many takeaways from the program and I'd love to talk about all of them, I think the, the, the biggest one or one that I'd like to highlight the most is, is the Clifton Strengths profile. And I don't know if you've listened to my audio at all, but I've always been like labeled very unorthodox in everything that I've done. And it was so nice to take this Clifton Strengths profile to understand like what, what, I'm, what my makeup is or how do I make decisions. Um, and I think it was a very profound analysis because now I know the, um, the importance of what I do, but also I can recognize that everyone else has their own Clifton Strengths profile and it's, it's never gonna match mine. Um, so it's important to, to, to know mine and then to understand that everyone else has their own. Um, I think we can make decisions and select people to be in our teams that have profiles similar to ours. However, that's not, that's not the best and you won't get the best solution that way. And then also, what can we do at FCA? I think the stereotypes and solutions is the, is the best box for that answer. We've justified women not going into these roles for the reasons on the left. Well, we say there's no work-life balance. You know, we were, we were talking at 1230 last night about an FX issue. So saying that there's demanding hours or um, inflexible work schedules, um, saying that we don't have role models, there's no job satisfaction, these roles have always been dominated by men. Just, just going down the list, I think we've justified it for all of those reasons. And I think we can transition to the column on the right, which basically says, well, let's normalize flexible work schedules. I think COVID has done a really great job of doing this. We can participate in mentorships, with, which FCA has great mentorships that I've been participated in. Make the work meaningful. So how many times or how much of my day is spent copying and pasting or refreshing. So just make things uh, yep. more meaningful or a reason to be there because women are very passionate about what they do. Um, I, I think this column on the right is a perfect representation of what we can do, not only within FCA, but also other organizations and industries. Wonderful. Thank you very much. I appreciate the insight. Hey, Shelby, this is Emily. You mentioned, uh, I believe it was in 2006 was the first time that a woman was in a director level position or above at FCA. And I'm curious if this seems to be as far as that particular company comparing to the rest of the industry is that typical for the financial sector? Does it seem like the company was lagging behind? Or even though 2006 wasn't that long ago, like you said, uh, do you feel like the company is actually a little bit ahead of the curve? Good question. So it's hard to say as a whole. However, um, FCA is probably lagging behind. There are more progressive companies. Um, so Ruth Porat is the number one here, and she worked, she's the Google or ABC CFO. And so obviously those organizations are going to do have women um, in the roles sooner. I don't have a specific number to provide you. However, I think um, we're a little behind at FCA compared to other organizations. Um, also, for example, one of our main competitors, GM, um, they have both a CEO and a CFO woman as of a couple months ago, the CFO just resigned from her role. So, so at least in our industry with the, the big three, um, one third of them was represented by women. Shelby, this is Michelle. Um, so you were discussing work-life balance and the conversations that you guys had regarding that. That is a huge problem for me. Um, so in your discussion, what were some of the things um, that you guys determined? So even since COVID, I've never been at home. I'm still at work. Um, generally, I'm at work till six, seven o'clock in the evening. So, how, in your discussions, what did you guys determine or was a great balance for you all? I think we have to address it in in all of the unique circumstances. I don't think there's going to be one underlying answer for every industry. At least for me, um, I have been working from home since the beginning of COVID, so I think it has definitely brought in more flexibility. However, I think. Um, 
there are other solutions that we can we can review. I I just don't I I haven't researched them yet because of my industry. Um, we. Because of COVID, we've also, um, so we've normalized some flexible work schedules and work arrangements. We've also shifted some of the workplace culture along with uh, greater understanding of family obligations. So I think, I think um, it's going in our favor, at least right now. Thank you. Shelby, this is D. Dodd. I noticed in the corner uh, of the compensation and recognition that there is some finance monthly CFO awards there's a drastic difference between the amount of men and women that get those awards. Do you know why that is, or can you explain maybe why? Um, well, I would say the number one reason is just because men are more represented in the field. So, so if you have a population of 100 people and 99 of them are men, then it's more likely that they're going to um, be represented more. Um, this, this graph is just a representation that only women have been represented on the featured winners 46 times and then only one time on the cover. Um, and, and so once once we normalize women and, and bring them into the, these levels or roles, then I think that the population will get greater and then we'll see um, some more leveled numbers. Thank you. Thank you, Shelby. I think uh, it's time to move to the next presenter. However, I want to point out that these presentations are going to be available, the posters, until October 31st. There is the audio there, the abstract, of course, the presentation itself. And you can contact the author directly. Um, there are already comments and uh, uh, questions and answers there, but you can, um, contact the author in a later time if you're interested in and when you will have more time to review the, the presentations, the e posters in detail. Okay. Thank you, Shelby. I will ask you to stop sharing your screen and then we will move forward with Pam and her presentation. Okay, I think I, I have it up for everybody to see. Um, so my poster presentation is on navigating decisions outlining the traje trajectory of a woman's journey of self-discovery as a na um, non-traditional student. Basically, if you look up in the left-hand corner, there's a caterpillar that turned into a butterfly. I'm, I'm older, I'm one of the older ones. Um, I believe I'm older than some of the instructors on here, God bless them. But, um, I think life experience sometimes gives you an advantage. So non-traditional sometimes can be uh, sound negative. Um, and there's, it's new in getting more and more um, assistance with in, on institutions and in, in recognizing that um, more non-traditional students are coming back. They're finding changes of times are completely different and um, we, we, we need to continue our education. So this really is more of a personal journey. Um, I didn't do it so much for professional for this program. I did it for a personal. Um, I always tease and, and everybody in the program has heard me say I'm a jack of all trades and master of none because I don't know why I'm put on this earth yet. You know, I don't have like a niche thing. I, I've done, uh, I've been in a lot of programs and, and this one kind of gave me a platform to put together why I am made up the way I am and and you know my past affects my present but to be in the present and not hang on to the past and then where I want to go for the future and to be a leader especially a woman there's lots of risks involved um, women don't naturally take a lot of risks we have we are nurturers so we usually have we're caregivers so if we have children at home or anything that we already have established in our life, taking a risk is very scary. So negotiating um, pays and things like that, sometimes we shortchange ourselves. And, and quite frankly, I'm sick and tired of it. Women need to advocate for themselves. So this was a really cool, like absolutely enlightening program for me personally. Um, I did just enroll into the MLD program as well. So I'm kind of double dipping there. So I still have 
a long way to go in my journey. But I thought this was a really cool start. Um, and, and I'll just share what I've learned. Um, Clifton Strengths, as Shelby was mentioning, was a phenomenal way to find out our genetic makeup and why we make the choices we do. And command was my top. Now, Dan, if you can correct me if I'm wrong, because he taught this session, but command is not demand. Command just means I, I, uh, I have a little Im impatient about some stuff. I want to jump in and get things started. I may not know exactly what to do, but I'm gonna find out who can do it and I'm gonna get it done. Um, so sometimes that can kind of come off a little strong to some people, but it's, it's, it's a learning process. And once you learn that, that, that strength, you know how to control it a little bit. So that was really cool because only, um, and, and Dan, this is where I was gonna ask you, 2% of people that take this self-assessment are in the, com they have the top command. So I was kind of impressed with myself, which I never usually am. So that was kind of cool to find out about myself. But I also, um, in the top five is belief. So that was really a strong point for me to point out because I believe in my values and my ethics and I take them very serious. I'm passionate about things that I believe in. I do a lot of um, cancer awareness programs in, in our community here in Terre Haute. I've chaired the Relay for Life several times and I, I'm really big on advocating for cancer awareness in our community. So having that command yet having that belief goes perfectly hand in hand, but it's not, it's my, it's more of my volunteering. So that was not something that I would think that would go hand in hand with my, my professional career, but it actually really does, especially when working with people and building those relationships because you can't come off too strong because you'll cut off those networking opportunities. So it was kind of cool just to learn that about myself. And um, moving forward, you can see that I did a fun SWAT on myself. Um, everybody likes these little um, emoji things and, and uh, uh, avatars. So I kind of did um, one about myself on SWAT. Personally, I wanted to know my strengths. I, you can't focus too much on weaknesses, but it does give you an, a platform to figure out where I need to work, what I need to work on. Um, threats and opportunities are always going to be there. You just need to figure out for yourself what's the best path that you need to, to, to go on. How can I be the best self if I don't know where I, who, who I am? And, and to share that and help others encourage them to be their best selves in whatever they do. I like to encourage people. So I, I kept saying, I'm no good to anybody else if I can't figure out myself. So this was a really <laughs> eye-opening um, program here with and, and doing sitting down and doing that SWAT. I probably uh, eight weeks ago would have probably listed 20 things as a weakness but I've learned that you have to go on your strengths you have to push through and you have to look more at the opportunities if you focus on the bad parts even though they they made you who you are and and that's that's okay you have to become self-aware that those don't do not define you and you have much more to give and you have to just move forward so to, to reach out and get help was another thing um, on the right side I'm kind of jumping around but I have fun with this um, advocating for myself um, believing in myself that's something that I constantly have battled my entire life I I think as a chubby kid and made fun of and bullied as, a, as you know, growing up, um, you were constantly in competition with your own self, let alone everybody else, but you get in your own head with things. And someone says, well, you need to do this and you need to do that. And you just figure out through, through these stages sometimes that you, you've got to do it for yourself. But to do that, you have to believe in yourself and you have to gather support. Put the people around you, you can check them off, list, Put those people around you that can build you up, that will get you there. And this program, every one of the instructors did just that for me because they know I've said, I do not know what to do my project on. I have no idea. And they kept saying, 
well, tell us about your, your journey and tell us about where you, and they said, you, you just told us your, your whole poster presentation. And I'm like, wow, I didn't know I was that interesting. So this was just a fun way for, for me to share this, especially as a woman. I'm gonna kinda go down here. And I know a lot of people have already kind of looked over the posters, but I wanna zoom in so you can see risk factors. Um, you, you know, this was something that really, be, before you go back to school, I, I had a two year degree at 19 years old. I thought I was the stuff, you know, I thought I was cool, I got a full time job. And if you live anywhere around Terre Haute, you know how many industries have left. You know how many companies have left. I had a full-time job at 19 years old and four, four years later it closed. So I was like, what am I gonna do? So I've constantly just struggled starting over everywhere I go because I didn't, I lacked, I lacked the self-confidence. I lacked a lot of things in my own self, but I didn't, being a, um, a first person to graduate of college, I didn't have the support at home because they just didn't know where to, to help me. They never went to, to school. So that was something that I had to find on my own. Um, I went back to get my bachelor's degree. I just graduated in 2017. So this is something that has been a constant struggle, almost 50 years old, and going to you know, further it in the grad program at St. Mary's. But it's just something that I think by putting this together as the risk factors, for myself keeps me on track. I know what's gonna jump in my way. I know the possibilities. I do not have a computer at home. I do not have internet at home. I actually tether. This computer is from my work that I have permission to take home. And I tether my, uh, my internet through my cell phone. These are hurdles that we face, but we find our resources and we find a way through it. And to do that, you, you have to have um, that ability to, to reach out and make yourself vulnerable sometimes. Um, the, the individual values that drives motivation, again, I'm a very passionate person, um, but I found out while, while doing this, it's more like a strategic plan for me. Um, I figured out what my attitudes and behaviors were. I went and I started to make the course of action like I kept thinking I want to make more money that's why I need to go back to school I want to do this but I found out through this actual program that I did it for more of a personal gain so in doing that I think I'm at a better place to learn in the in the grad program and then share my journey with others and as a leader I want to motivate them to have, find the best in themselves I, I'm totally ready to to take that on for myself but um and i have to check in with myself to make sure i do that but uh i, I love to empower other people so really I, I think the risk and reward of taking this particular program and going to um college at no matter what age no matter what um background you have you you really should have find more confidence in yourself because I think as a woman we're told to you know be seen but be quiet so that's been something that's been in in my head but um, I have a voice now and and I'm going to use it so I don't know if anybody has any questions or they want me to zoom in a certain place or suggestions um, Pam it's Michelle um, first and foremost, like you have moved me to emotions, like I absolutely love this. Um, and when I was looking over the poster, I love that you did the, your own squat on yourself. Um, just you hit on a lot of very vital points. This is being women and women in the work field that we're in now and just trying to, to find your way back again. Um, I graduated in 2018 and my experience then with going to school um, is completely different than what it is now. And um, I think before when I took a lot for granted, <laughs> as in this experience is completely different. Um, so this, this uh, your post award overall has been, like you hit the nail on the head on so many things that I see in myself. I feel I, I absolutely love this and just feel like you 
you poured your heart into this. I think this was this is really great. Other times you say, great job. And, uh, Shelby, I loved yours too. This is more personal. <laughs> more personal. It kind of took you to a different place. So this is just really great. Well, and I think that's part of my growth, um, you know, and just in knowing where where I am and take a breath and self-aware of where I want to be. But um, sometimes, like you said, with the work balance, uh, work life thing, um, that's a great term. But is there really a, a good balance in either one of those? You just have to absolutely find which one's more important at the time. You have to have your support team there backing you up and you have to find out, and I'm telling you, if you did one of the risk factors or the SWATs on yourself, it might even actually help you because there's, I will get text after text from people and if I'm not in the mood, I'm not even going to respond because it's probably not gonna be positive. So I choose my time it's a time management thing. It's a personal journey, and absolutely everybody has their their own path. But you just have to figure out if you hop off the wrong way. There's always a way back. There always is a way. And and if, when even if you don't feel like there is a way back, make a new one. Take a shovel and put it in your back pocket. <laughs> well, amen. Amen. Right, that's what I got for that. Just amen. <laughs> and Pam, talking about time management. Yes. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> To a couple of more questions. Don't worry about that because we will work on that uh, during MLD courses so much. <laughs> uh, but it's very interesting and it needs courage to expose yourself like this. Uh, but I think we can take one or two more questions and then the rest, if there are more questions, they can contact you so we can move forward with the next uh, presenter with Chris Christina. Hey, this is Jamie. I just had a question um, for you, Pam. It's a great job. It's awesome to um, see the self-reflection and I can um, truly, I guess, understand maybe where you're coming from at this age going back to school. My question for you would be this information that you've gathered and you've put together in a fabulous format. How will you take this and then utilize it in your current position? Great question. Um, I actually have already. Okay, so 2020 is already a, a wackadoo year, right? So we, we already have a lot of um, trials and tri tribulations and overcoming um, anxiety and every day. So this poster will be hanging in my office to remind me every day to self, you know, check myself because that is something that's so important. No matter what's going on, there are bigger more important things going on in the world. And, and sometimes if I start getting a little overly onto that command uh, strength that I have, or you know, having a bad day, I, I check in with myself and I have actually uh, talked to all my coworkers and say, you know this about me? Why didn't you guys like point this out? I didn't realize that I was doing this. And then also with the Clifton strengths, I learned all the other 34 the, of the strengths that other people have. And I started kind of like putting, I, I don't know their strengths, but I kind of could match up what their strengths are and mold how I process and, and work with them to keep a really good, it's like, okay, it's like an acceptance thing. It's like just checking and making sure that they're okay because they, they hold that strength that maybe they just need some self encouragement because they're an introvert or a quieter person. So I've really, you know, in knowing yourself, it's really, it's really helpful in to uh, work with others. And I work at Indiana State University in the events department. So there's a lot of components that I work with on campus. I could be um, talking near the trash bin by the guys in maintenance and then I'm up at the president's office working on um, graduation. So I have to be a little bit of a chameleon. So um, I can relate to all kinds of different components. And I just, I make sure to, at the end of the day, hone myself in who I really am and, and not lose that. And I think hanging this on the wall is gonna help me a lot. So Pam, thank you. What I would suggest now is you stop sharing your screen. Okay. And Tina will move forward. And after that, you can go to the chat room. There is a question from Rasti there. 
So you can reply in the chat room and so everyone can catch up in the chat room. Um, and in the meantime, Christina has to share her screen. Thank you, Pam. Thank you. I'm looking for my share screen and I don't, oh, there it is, okay. Okay, do you guys all see what I see? Yes. Okay, just making sure here. Let me scoot it over to the right spot. Okay, can everybody still see the poster okay? All right, good. Yes. Um, good evening, everyone. I am Christina Pearson, and it is my honor to present to you this evening uh, my virtual poster titled A Voice in the Crowd. Um, it's truly been um, an inspiring eight weeks of education with all of the faculty. Um, it's been a little bit of a difficult eight weeks for me, but I was able to take away so many things from this program that I truly needed um, to actually piggyback on the uh, MLD program that I also wrapped up in August. So as I was wrapping up my thesis, I was also beginning um, this program here, and it truly piggybacked each other so well that I was able to voice I was able to create my poster based on what my thesis originally was, which was um, titled a women, women in leadership and their influence on rural community. Um, and this poster um, kind of was inspired from that original thesis program. And um, I piggybacked right from that. So throughout basically where I came up with the voice in the crowd is um, throughout my personal and professional life. And I believe many of the women can relate to this that are listening to me now. Um, and the men can also relate to this, that you've watched women struggle because they can't seem to gain their voice. They're always sitting back watching um, someone else be able to speak up first, be able to um, say something that they wanted to say or they had to say, but they just couldn't find the right word to articulate or they couldn't find the right um, the right tone to get someone's attention and a lot of times we think that that confidence is just already inside you and maybe for some women it is the confidence and the courage is already built into some women but a lot of women have to be encouraged and inspired to to break out and to have that voice to to find their strengths as the girls have talked about a lot on the clifton strengths test um, to find the strength to actually become that voice in the crowd so that you can be heard um, so basically, what the what my poster is here. Let me see if I can zoom in a little bit. Um, you'll see where I have my abstract over here, and I basically I touch on a few things of of why women tend to be um, underheard, um, misperceived, and a lot of times statistically it shows that women are underheard and misperceived basically because the tone of our voice is different. We tend to be more soft spoken. We tend to be more gentler. Um, and sometimes it's voice pitch, sometimes it's word choices, but often and more times than not, it's just simply due to the inherent social and cultural biases that we as a community are not used to women actually speaking up and, and listening to what they have to say. Um, but statistically acts actually show that women are better at negotiations, they're better at influencing uh, decisions, they're better at creating quick solutions, um, and they're, they're really good at de-escalating situations and thinking outside of the box. And so I think in time, as more women begin to realize that their voice does have value and that they do have something to say, we can set a tone for the future of women. Um, but it's gonna take someone to start doing that first. Um, and so our voice is an amazing gift and it's a responsibility for us women to begin to lead the path for to the girls behind us. I have a daughter and it's important for me, especially as she's getting into her teenage years, for her to understand she has a voice and she deserves to be heard no matter what it, that situation is. And I think we've seen um, Rosa Parks and the notorious RBG that we just lost. Both of those women began to lead paths for us that if we wouldn't have followed some of their leadings, we don't have a clue where we would be today, but they have to learn to fight for the, we have to learn to fight for what we believe in. And RBG said it best when she said, fight for the things you really care about, but do it in a way that will lead others to, to join you. 
And um, we just have to learn to be that first person. And so with this eight weeks was really a program that allowed us to do that. It, and like I said, it piggybacked from my thesis, which was awesome because I could actually take what I learned in my thesis and then really zero in on myself for the past eight weeks. Um, and like Pam said, we, she created a SWOT analysis and I did too as well. And so you'll see right here that um, my strengths from the Clifton SWOT assessment was um, my highest was a realtor, which means I enjoy close relationships, a futuristic. I like to ins be inspired by the future and I'm energized by, by vision, um, an achiever, hardworking, and um, I take great satisfaction in being productive. Significance means I desire to make a great impact and focus, which means I prioritize and then I act. Um, and this, what the, the Clifton Strengths assessment does not include weaknesses, which I love because I love being able to see what my strengths are and see what everybody else's strengths are. Um, but I wanted to kind of figure out, we know we all have weaknesses, so we have to address them at some point. And as we went through the program, it was clear to see the girls had different strengths than I did completely. But what made it great was if we worked in any kind of group situation or a Zoom meeting, what I didn't think of, maybe Pam did, or maybe Catherine did, or maybe Jennifer or Shelby did. And that's because where my strengths were good and their weaknesses were bad, we could cover each other. So in my opinion, being able to create this SWOT analysis allowed me to identify a few, just a few weaknesses, not really focus on them, but to know that they're there so that I can bring in people that, into my life that can help build up in those areas. And then I can attack those threats. We're always going to have threats in our life. That's just part of life. But if you know where your weaknesses are and you can bring in the people to build those weaknesses up in you, then you can attack those threats together. And then it allows for more opportunities. So as here, I've got threatened threats, no offense, men, but I do have you guys listed as a threat to us women, mainly because you are a little bit more vocal than we are, obviously. Um, and I, but I also had closed-minded women and um, cultural biases listed. I, let's all be real. You know, women can be their worst best friend. I mean, that you have to, you have to know where all of your threats are. And when you build a team of women together, or a team of men and women mixed together, you can annihilate those threats and open yourself up for more opportunities. So opportunities that's such as being the first. Maybe you'll be the first. Um, county councilman in your small community, or maybe you'll be the first person to speak at a school that, that provides passion, that, that resonates with a young soul somewhere. Um, you don't know what kind of change you can make if you just simply combine your strengths, zero in on your weaknesses enough to create balance and attack your threats so that opportunities can be made. Um, identifying your strengths allows you to better position yourself as a leader and guide, and that's the way that you attack those those threats, like I said, and move in to make more opportunities. Um, women are doing a great job. I'm going to scroll over here. They're starting to really do a good job statistically of um, taking, becoming leaders as far as in different professional careers. So the voices are being heard. Right now, more women are in professional career like positions than men in law, medicine, academia, and financial situations. However, if you look at this chart, the lower lines right here, the bars, these are women holding leadership positions. So in the law profession, we have more women that are lawyers than men, but yet we have less women as um, partners. In the same in medicine, we have more men or we have more women leading medical degrees, but we have less of them leading in the top positions. Academia, we have more women in academic, academics, but yet we have more educational leaders as far as um, deans and professors that are at the top as of men. And CFOs, CEOs, and COOs are all lined up to be professionally going to be more men than women. So we still have some work to do. And we are on the rise. We do hold more master degrees, medical degrees, and we are heavy in the labor force at this time, but we still have work to do. And I think that it's mainly because not everyone has found their voice yet. Um, Melinda Gates, I have a quote on here by Melinda Gates that I love, and it's, a woman with a voice is by definition a strong woman. And we as women have to learn that we have value to what we have to say. We have a passion and we just need to share it. 
we are willing to listen and we have courage to stand up for others. We just have to be able to be bold enough to do it. And we have to inspire others to stand up with us. But we can't do that if we're gonna softly sit in the back of the crowd and not, and not be willing to be the first to stand out. So we have to be not afraid to stand alone at first because I guarantee if you make that first stance, you're gonna look back and see many women standing behind you in support of you. Others need you to be the first. Um, if you're not the first, then who knows when it will be. And as we have seen over the years, statistically, it's a slow incline for women. And if we can begin to push that a little bit harder, maybe for our future daughters, we'll see something different and give them a path that isn't so difficult as what we've had to deal with. So I know we're running close on time. So um, I'd just like to open it up for any questions. Um, hi, hi, Christina, this is Peggy. Yeah. Hi, Peggy. Knowing what you know now, what would you do different? No, knowing all these wonderful things you've discovered about yourself, what would you do different? Oh my gosh, so many things. Um, as a mother, as a wife, as a, as a student um, in careers that I've had, I would do so many things different. There's so many times that I was the person that would say, hey, how about, and I don't know if anybody listened to my audio, but I start off with saying, hello, hi what about me? You know, I've got something to say. I would, I would be a lot more not demanding because I think as women, we can still hold that gentleness to ourselves, but I think we could be a little more out there. We could put our hand up a little bit higher or, or grab the microphone if you have to, or, or send the email that needs to be heard. Um, and I think that's where I would have probably do a lot more different. I've sat back for so long and just been more humble and not as outgoing as I should be in different situations. And I think it would have, instead of taking me 20 years to complete my degree, I probably would have done it a lot sooner, right out of high school, like I wanted to. But I followed what I was, what I thought I was supposed to do in other people's eyes instead of what I wanted to do. I'd like to ask that question in a slightly different way, because I think when we focus on what we could have done, it can get very negative. And what I'm wondering is, knowing what you know now, what will you do different moving forward? Oh, so many different things coming forward. I mean, I have a, a plethora of lists of things that I want to do, but I think the one that stands out the most is I want to make sure that whatever I do, it inspires others to follow me, including my daughter. I don't want her to ever think that she doesn't have a voice or that she has to um, that she has to feel what she's feeling and not be allowed to express it. Um, I don't want her to ever feel like she has to stand alone in a room of a crowd of people and feel like she can't actually voice what she has to say because she's afraid that it won't be heard or because she's afraid it's not the right thing that's supposed to be said. I want her to know that it's okay to have differences with people and it's okay to not see eye to eye, but it's also okay to stand up for what you believe in and encourage others to do the same because maybe you just need to be that one voice. And I think for me, that's, that's what I'll do different coming forward is I'm going to put myself that I may not be the only one that feels that way. So maybe how I'm feeling is going to change the room around me, the outcome around me. Hi, Christina. It's Devin. Um, hey, Devin. I've really enjoyed following your journey and I love seeing your presentation here. Um, so you included the Clifton Strengths in your SWOT analysis. And just to like nerd out a little bit on Clifton Strengths, I'm wondering, um, was there a strength that you did not have in your top strengths that you wish you would have had or a strength that you see in other people that you know would make them good collaborators? Um, definitely. And um, Shelby was probably the one that I, I focused in quite a bit in the last eight weeks because she is so analytical and that was not even near my top 10. Um, and I don't think that way. So a lot of times I tend to to be more emotional and more hands-on and more acting. And she can step back and think it through and see the big picture where I'm just like, let's do this, this, and this. And she's ready to be like, wait a minute. What about if we do this, this is going to happen if we do that. So she's very strategic and analytical. And I don't have that in me very well. It, I have to make myself stop and slow down. And so um, definitely I could see where you could put her in there to, um, 
and I have that on my weaknesses where you could put her in on my analysis and balance me out so that she could just pull the reins back a little bit and say, now, wait a minute, let's try and think this through. That might not be the best idea. Um, so definitely, that's a great question. Um, because yeah, we did. I wa that was part of why I created the SWOT analysis was because I could see so many differences between the girls and I that um, it was inspiring. Because you know, so many times you look at threats in your life as threats, and you don't really attack the threats. You just try to go around the threats. Well, if you collaborate with people, you can attack the threats together, and it opens up a whole nother box of opportunities for you. Great. Thank you, Christina. You can stop sharing and we will move forward with Katherine. We're not doing well on our Christina, time management tonight. Christina, there's comments in the, in the chat you may want for, to answer. Okay. Yes. All I of you, actually. There are comments for all of you. At least from Dr. Albano, there is a, a question that... Uh, I think uh, requires all your attention. And I'm talking to the presenters. If you scroll up. I'm yes. trying. Uh, Christina, you can share. I'm you trying to find it and I cannot find it. I think I had this problem on my computer last time. Uh, Let me see if I can make it. At the top of your screen, Christina. I can read it. I'll read it for you. It says, all of these posters are wonderful presentations of personal growth, discovery, and inspiration. I'm wondering what the most valuable insight or inspiration each woman got from this program and what capability they will work to develop next to best serve their calling. So, yes, that's the question. But I think what she's looking for is to stop sharing her screen. And that's what we have to do right now. Okay, Great. here it is. We did that. So I would like uh, Catherine to share her screen. Great, Catherine. And the rest of you, you can go to chat room and replying, I mean, posting your answers at the same time, but we have to move forward. Yes, Catherine, it's your turn. Thank you, Lamprini, and thank you everyone for joining us today on this Saturday um, evening. It's a joy to be with you all. Um, as Lamprini said, my name is Catherine Shima, and I will be doing um, presenting today upon the essential role of emotional intelligence, communication, and the art of strategies for female leaders. Um, I really want to uh, be mindful of time today because I know you're all very busy people. So I'm just going to go ahead and start off with the objective and my goal with this uh, project. And it was um, a bit different. I took it in, in a different route. Um, I really, really would love um, for any female um, coming to this presentation to just take something positive away that will help them in their journey, no matter where they are in their journey. If um, they're a top CEO, like a seasoned veteran or um, a new person just coming in out of graduate school um, into their career. Um, I just really think that there is something hopefully for, for anyone and in this presentation. And for the men, I would really love to shed light on um, the feminine genius and um, the strengths of women and how so much of our strengths are viewed as weaknesses in the workplace. But I would really love to challenge that notion. So I just kind of ask that you guys have open hearts and open minds because I know that this is um, really changing or challenging the status quo because I'm kind of trying to change um, the way that work cultures are. So um, I can go ahead and give you a quick overview and then go into questions. So for emotional intelligence, there's four main categories, which is self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, and relationship management. Um, and the emotional intelligence is a ranking system and women rank very high uh, predominantly because of um, our feminine genius. And the feminine genius consists of receptivity, sensitivity, generosity, and maternity. So because of our natural um, maternalistic uh, instincts to kind of nurture and care for others, um, it's very hard to say no in a lot of instances because we just want to help and give and give of ourselves. Um, and which is why we do rank high on um, emotional intelligence. 
But it is important to establish very strong boundaries. Um, so we are not aggressive, but we're assertive. We're not doormats, but we get, our, we get the point across um, and we are taken seriously as female leaders. Um, so the strategies, there's different strategies for getting your message across and then strategies for what I like to call crucial conversations, which means having difficult conversations because um, as you'll see in Jennifer's poster with her title, it's, it's rock the boat. Women, we, it's, we don't really like to rock the boat. You know, we're, we're just more kind of with our feminine genius, more um, collaborative. We like to bring others together. We don't really like to have those. Um, it's just a little bit harder, I think, to have those difficult conversations. Um, so it's important to have those strategies and boundaries when it comes to having crucial conversations because it is essential in leadership positions to have uncomfortable and crucial conversations. So just because they're difficult, they still have, we still have to have them, unfortunately. So then I want to discuss negotiations with you and why women um, have such an advantage with negotiations. So the female advantage with negotiations is that um, because of our feminine genius and scoring high on emotional intelligence, um, we take a more integrative approach, which means um, it's also called growing the pie. And that means that we, as women, we don't see it as all or none, win or lose, um, hyper competitive. It's more like how we can collaborate. Like, what are your goals? What are my goals? And how can we both achieve what we would like to achieve and, and both get there further? So it really, really works on, um, it's great in the long term because it works on our relationship building. So it's not burning that bridge. It's not saying, well, I won, you lost, and we're never gonna work together again. It's saying, no, we're both going to, to achieve here. We're going to, grow both, both organizations. And um, we're going to keep continuing to also grow and nurture that relationship. So further down the line, um, we can still work together and create a better society overall. So I will go ahead and go into questions if anyone has any questions for me. Hi, Catherine, this is Devin. Um, so I'm curious on your different negotiation styles, were you able to find some well-known historical examples that really helped uh, show those two different styles? Yes, um, and I actually, I have an example that I would love to share with you because it made, it, it made understanding the difference between distributive, which is a fixed pie, and the integrative growing the pride approach. And the men um, are normally a lot better at the distributive. Um, so the example that I read, which I, it's, it's phenomenal. So imagine there are two chefs and both chefs want to use um, a lemon, but there's only one lemon in the refrigerator. Okay, well, one chef wants to use, um, the juice for the lemon. And the other chef wants to use um, the peel or another part of the lemon for something that they're making. So if they wouldn't have discussed with each other in just in a distributive way of, well, I want the lemon, well, I'm gonna get the lemon or you're not gonna get the lemon. So instead of not saying what each one, each, one, um, each chef is going to use the lemon for, it would just be like win or lose. Someone would get the lemon and someone wouldn't get the lemon or someone would get half of the lemon and the other person would just get half of the lemon. But that's not even really, that is not the most productive or integrative solution um, or negotiation approach uh, because if they both communicated with each other and said, okay, well, I would like to use the juice for my dish. And the other one said, okay, I would love to use the lemon rind for my dish. Okay, perfect. I don't need that. You can have that. Let me squeeze the juice out of mine. You can have the whole, the whole thing. Peel it all off. So in this instance, both of them are getting what they want. They're achieving their results. They're going to, they're getting exactly what they want. So really no one loses. So it's like, there's no, um, there's no loss. There's only, it's a, it's a win-win situation 
because they're both getting their objectives and needs met. So it's not breaking that relationship, but it's actually making it better because of their communication. And that's essential to um, having an integrative negotiation. Does that make sense, Devin? Yes, it does. That's a great explanation. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, it's uh, Vicki. Hi, Vicki. Uh, hey, hi, everybody. This is, I'm learning so much. I love, I love all of the presentations in the um, poster. So it's, I'm, I'm getting a great, great out of this. So I just, from my uh, experience working with women leaders, one of the problems is their ability to negotiate promotions and, and uh, willing to ask for the salary they deserve and they end up getting paid less as a result of that. So how do you square that kind of data and some of this stuff from catalysts from prior, um, you know, that, that we have lots of women in all these different fields from uh, Christina and, and uh, but we, at the top, we don't have the leaders. So how do you square that? And what would you recommend to uh, someone who's going into a negotiation around salary or, or, you know, promotion of how to get that, you know, win-win situation where it's collaborative. Right. Well, first of all, I just want to say thank you so much for asking me that question because it's a great question and I love, I love it. And when I was doing my research, um, it discussed that a lot. So I'm really excited. I hope I can tackle this big issue in a quick amount of time. But to summarize it, women don't ask. Mm -hmm. A lot of the times they don't even ask. And if they yes. do, they concede so much quicker than men. And honestly, I, I know it sounds so simple and minute, but it, it's mm -hmm. just mind blowing. It's like, well, you know, we don't even ask. And so the men, they go in, they have these huge asks, these huge, huge reaches. Yes. And um, women, they, they just most of the time they don't even ask like so much of the research and the data out there is like, yes, you have to ask, you're not going to get in, you're not going to achieve and get to what you want if you don't even advocate for yourself, which is where all of that self advocacy comes in. So it's using the integrative approach saying, Hey, these are my skills. This is what I can do for you. And how, let's, let's go together. Let's grow together. It's not taking mm -hmm. away, but we're going to let's add to this. Um, department and because it, it's going to give me so much more to do and run with this so that's the first part ask ask mm -hmm. for more be ambitious don't be audacious like do not go in there and be um, thinking you don't even deserve to be there first of all you know know your stuff know you're worthy of being there know that you have a place there um, know your facts know your research go in there prepared and have it all laid out. Um, second part, don't concede immediately. Don't do it. <laughs> don't because the men, they hold out so much longer and the longer you hold out, the better your chances are. So ask for more, start out higher and don't concede. Wait, be patient. Don't just say, okay, at the first sign that you get because that is a huge, huge reason why women are lagging behind because they're not even, they're not even asking mm -hmm. and you have to be audacious and ask. Um, there was actually an example. I love the example um, that I found in the literature and it was that two professors, same degree, same everything, male, female, all the same credentials. One, the male professor went in he asked for a, an assistant, he asked for a higher salary, he asked for a paid sabbatical, a paid vacation. The woman went in and she was like, oh, thank you, thank you, I'm so, I'm so grateful for this. Um, didn't ask for any, like she, she barely asked for any of the other stuff. And so what does the man do? He achieved so much further in his career and she's lagging behind getting paid less, mm -hmm. less, not because she's not any less qualified. No, she's, she was equally qualified, but she didn't ask and she conceded too quickly. So I hope Thank that answers. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you. If you have more questions for Catherine, you can add them in the chat room. It's already, we're off track, way off track. It's 6.06. .06. So we have to move forward with Jennifer. So Catherine, could you please stop sharing your screen? Yes. Great, thank you. Because we have two more. So Jennifer and Dr. Jenny's uh, Mitchell presentation. It's Jennifer next. Yes, it's Jennifer. Oh, I'm sorry, Jennifer. Yes, Jennifer, could you share your screen? Great. Yes, we can. It seems that you stop sharing after it pops up. Let, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. We can hear you. I'm having some issues with the site. Let me go to my PowerPoint to see. Yeah. Let me know. Do you see my PowerPoint? Yes. Okay, awesome. Don't use the site. You can use your uh, PowerPoint, the poster. That's fine. We can see it now. Awesome. My name is Jennifer. Let me look this way. My name is Jennifer Matthews. Um, I am a regulatory and compliance and an investigator supervisor um, at a pharmaceutical company. And my presentation is called Rock the Boat, Analyzing Assertiveness as a Woman of Color in Leadership. Um, really quick, I'm going to go over it. Um, you'll notice in my poster that there's um, an interchange between Black and African American. When the term Black is used, um, it's more of a visual you can be black anywhere in the world. When African-American is used, we're talking about blacks that are here in the United States and born of the United States, if everyone understands that. So the reason why this is personal to me, um, part of my research um, being as a leader in the pharmaceutical company right now, which was a continuation of my thesis looking at um, the top pharmaceutical company CEOs for 2020 um, of the the top 20 there's only two and um, right now my um, my the company that I'm in the CEO she is part of that she's number 10 um, but of the top 20 there are no African American females there's only one African American gentleman but there are no African American females even and with that and looking at that one of the things um, from the EEOC in 2010, um, black women make up 7.6 of the workforce, just 7.6 of the workforce. And of that 7.6 of the workforce, only 1.5 are senior executives. So the 3.4 is where I'm at, meaning your supervisors, your group leaders, your managers. I'm in the 3.4%, but only 1.5 is of senior executive leadership. And the issue isn't always just trying to get into the door, right? You're in the door. There's some other things that as African-American leaders, we want to be supported um, while we are there. Um, part of my research was looking at navigating through race and gender and some of the things that African-American um, women that are in leadership deal with real quickly, um, the terms code switching, or you might hear people say they're using their work voice, meaning that they're, they're and it's something different or your appearance is different when you're at work around your coworkers compared to when you're on vacation or when you're with your family. And that can go from the terms that you're using or even the sound of your voice or how you're looking, maybe not wearing the corn rolls or the braids or your hair natural. Um, another thing is um, not being able to deal with the realities that are going on in the world at work. For example, some of the issues that are currently going on with the African American community, if, um, a white male or a white female, if they come in and they're expressive, we can't do that. We have to come in, work, and go home. Even though you might be torn up inside, you can't bring that to the workplace because you don't want anything to look as a negative light on yourself. Because again, you're part of the 7.6 
You don't want to rock anything negative light towards you. Another thing um, is not being able to truly speak your mind um, as other people may be able to do. For example, um, maybe a white male is able to sh give their opinion and to communicate and a woman, um, a black woman, African-American woman could say the same exact thing, but they're come off as being unprofessional or aggressive. And also, as I talked earlier about, it's not always just getting in the door with us as African-American black leaders, pulling someone up, mentoring and helping the future for that uh, 7.6 that's there, pulling them up, guiding them instead of, I'm just here, I don't want anyone else to have a piece of the plate. With that, really quickly, quickly, some of the stereotypes from research found of um, Black women leaders um, are being considered assertive or angry or having an attitude. Whereas in the African American community, if you're calling me exertive, no, I think I'm confident, I'm, I'm bold or I'm decisive, or if it's anger, no, I'm passionate or, or fervent or having an attitude, I'm, I'm just not being respected. We're commanding respect. Um, one of the major things that I learned from my research, Dr. Julie Hanks, um, defining assertiveness as a way of communicating that is clear, confident, and self-assured. But doing that, you're able to let other people have their own experience. And it's okay for them to have their own experience that's different from yours. With those, there's five skills of assertiveness. Um, and with those five skills, when you're able to navigate through that, you'll get five results of assertiveness. And those are really quickly self-reflection, which leads to clarity with oneself, self-awareness to confidence, self-soothing to calmness, self-expression to connection, and self-expansion to compassion. Um, of these, the one that I really had to, that checked me was the self-expansion, was the compassion part, was being able when someone, I didn't agree with someone or I'm like, why are they acting like that? It's just, you know what, I feel bad. Maybe they're having a bad day. Being able to have compassion and, and empathize with them. Um, so with that being said from, with the research, another, um, thing is, is that there's a lot of being an African-American leader, we tend to come into a job with a lot bearing on our shoulders. Um, we have the weight of representing our race as leaders. We're not just for ourselves or representing our family, but also for few the future generation coming in. We have that weight and not wanting to rock the boat by um, having a negative light because it's, well, oh, you know, if I'm, if I'm doing this or if nobody's talking about me or anything like that, you know, everything is good. And I'm just thankful to have a job. I'm just thankful to be in this position. So because I'm that 3.4%, I should just be okay and just stay there. But with that, African-American leaders, also women leaders tend to overachieve. We're the, we tend to try to get more degrees because we think that the work is going to speak for itself. And what I've learned with this and with the skills of assertiveness is just a way of maneuvering. I have my um, five Clifton strengths, which I've participated um, in, I think it's called About Me and Dignify, which was more about um, being able to communicate with others. I love the Clifton strengths because it's about me. Um, my five, um, top five are positivity, woo, which is basically that I'm able to, I like meeting new people and I'm able to charm, being an achiever, an activator, and self-assurance. Um, what I took out of this, and this was actually really sombering for me because I had um, a, a, a situation where I was put into a place where I should have been more assertive, just like Catherine talked about, I should have said, spoke up. And I didn't because it was like, I just don't want to get fired. I'm just glad to have a job. I'm glad to be here. Instead of saying, wait a minute, my work speaks for itself. This is what I want to negotiate because I, I just didn't want to rock the boat. I just wanted things to be easy. Um, 
So that's what I learned that I'm able to do that also to be able to set boundaries. And also what I've learned from this is I can share to the people I'm in the, the 3.4, but also to share to the 7.6%, those younger entry levels. This is how you maneuver yourself. This is how you do, but I'm also comfortable in who I am and it's okay to be comfortable. That's another thing I learned. It's okay to be comfortable with being touched from the sun or, or with my melanin. It's okay to be comfortable with that. And it's okay. It's okay. It's just okay. Um, one of the questions that I was emailed and I will yield it over. Um, do I think the disparity, um, speaking of the, the, what the EEOC provided, did I think, do I think the disparity is due to lack of intentional recruitment by the pharmaceutical industry of prospects at HBCUs and HBCU stands for historically black college universities or a failure of HBCUs to seek partnership internships with the pharmaceutical industry to expose students to the industry. I think it's both. I think it's both. Um, and I can say that there are different events. I know when I was in college, we would see the people coming in. I did not go to a HBCU. I went to a Big Ten college. We would see those job fairs or those reaching out. But my husband graduated from an HBCU. That didn't happen at, at his school. Um, also, there's other things like there's job fairs. The NAACP um, holds at their national convention huge job fairs. Um, one thing that was awesome is that my previous job as just being an employee, I was able to go and share and present. And you would be surprised how many people would just come. They were just interested what's going on because they saw someone that looked like them compared to someone that was white, a white male or white female from HR. They were willing to come to ask questions and to turn in um, their resume. So I will, for the respective time, I will yield it back or um, am ready for questions. Could I ask just a quick question? Yes, ma'am. What, what coaching would you give to your um, non-African-American um, colleagues to create an environment where your voice can be assertive assertively stated and not be put into the oh you're the you're the angry black woman in the in the room and i've had clients in which i've had that discussion so i i would love to hear your advice to to non to non black uh, african americans as to what we can do cuz this part of the change has to be with not just put on your shoulders, put on the shoulders of your peers and colleagues. Awesome. There's two things. Um, with me, it's acting as an angry black woman. Well, that's because I'm the only black woman in here. So who else right. is going to be the angry black woman? There's no other, there's no, <laughs> that's it. So I guess I am the angry black woman. So there's one, like open your eyes and see being here in South Texas, um, there is a large Hispanic community. Some of the places think we, we have no issues with minorities. We are 80% um, Latino, Hispanic, mix. no. It open your eyes. What is, what is in front of you? The second thing I would suggest is to um, non-African American black is checking yourself. Do you say when someone else is intense, well, they're just being an angry white woman. They're just being an angry Asian woman. You're just mm -hmm. being an angry Greek woman. Are you, are you saying <laughs> that about anybody else? You have to check yourself and realize where is this coming from? Why am I even asking this question? And then maybe again, starting there again, to me, it's simple. I feel that they're angry then why are you not talking to them to find out what is going on? Because then I would say, well, maybe you just don't know me, how I communicate. I wasn't angry. And I, and I had that with a peer a couple of years ago. I'm not angry because if I was angry, I would be maneuvering. No, it's, yeah. you know what I mean? There's a, a tone and a, and a mannerism where it's just quick to say, throw it off on the stereotypes. Oh, they're angry. Right. No, 
communicate with that person. That's just, that's me being, being passionate. So I would say again, open up, wait, you know, open your eyes, ask, check yourself. Why would I even, why would I say that? Why, why do I feel that tone? And then the next step, what are you going to do? If you felt uncomfortable or there's a situation in the atmosphere or the tone that you feel uncomfortable with, then maybe you need to address it to, for, for that bridge, you know, mm-hmm. to um, come into agreement. or maybe it's like, it's just yourself like, oh, we're on the same team. Okay. I was just making sure. So major, it's just communication. Mm-hmm. Great. And thank you, Jennifer. Communication, and we're going back. In the meantime, you stop sharing. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Jenny Mitchell will get ready. But we're talking about um, emotional intelligence, basically. Empathy. Make sure that you put the effort to understand the emotions of others and then manage them, which is very essential in leadership positions. Thank you. Dr. Jenny Mitchell. You can share your screen. Uh, Jenny, you are muted. All right. Great. <laughs> I won't take very long because um, actually the focus should be on the students. What, and I'm really proud of them. I think they did a great job. But I do want to spend a, just a little time to discuss why this course, why this program was different. No, in a normal graduate certificate program, you might have one facilitator, whereas in this program, we had five facilitators. And it, what's really interesting, we had five students. I'm sure they felt overwhelmed at times. Uh, but we did what was called a community of practice. And a community of practice has three elements. It has the domain, where we're talking about something we're interested in. In this case, it was women's leadership. It has a community. And in this case, it would be we were all in the same course shell. It wasn't like uh, Dan was doing one section and then the students went into a different course shell. It was we were all in the uh, 1D2L course shell. And the third thing is the uh, practice. And the practice actually allowed us to share our stories with each other and the thing that you know, when you know a community of practice works is when you have a rich discussion and that's the heart of a community of practice. And one of the things, I actually put some, some um, statistics on there, but there were more because I've, obviously we did these posters early. So the, at, at the time we did the posters, what I found was that 50% of the discussions were done by the facilitators. So it was 50% of the students and 50% of the facilitators. And that really is unusual. And it shows the level of, of thinking together and learning from each other. Students actually uh, forgave over 50 resources that they shared, like videos and books and quotes uh, all kinds of things. And you have to remember what's really interesting. This course started out, it was going to be done hybrid, face-to-face on campus that, at that community uh, at St. Mary of the Woods College. And what we ended up doing is that we converted it because of COVID-19 and we felt safer uh, doing that. But we wanted it to be an immersive virtual experience. We wanted them to uh, do some things. So we had our wheel decide icebreaker. So, uh, for example, uh, you know, and some of some of you'll recognize our our wheel decide icebreaker that we did had, you know, like what would your name be if you were an alien? You can't can't believe the kind of fun things that we had with that. Uh, during Vicky's session, one of our guest speakers who's here and Joe's here as well, Vicky actually wanted to do a polling session, and it was really interesting because as the students in entered information with her phones, a word cloud build, and it showed the characteristics of leadership. So we tried to do some very immersive, engaging experiences, and all the, all the product, the, the uh, web pages and so on, were built with HTML5 templates, which meant they were fairly professional looking. Uh, we have R- an RSS feed. Uh, the, now all of the uh, 
people, all the candidates here in the room are going to earn their badge. So they'll, they'll be getting that badge that they can carry as part of their credentialing. Uh, there were video notes. And of course, I think this culminating project of a virtual poster show, I don't know that we've ever had a virtual poster show at the woods. And to me, I feel like this is a real success in what, what we've done. And so I just want to uh, reiterate that this to me was a very, very uh, wonderful experience. And I hope that, uh, you know, that the students enjoyed it, the guest speakers that we had, as well as all the interactive exercises and fun things. I know we're, at times we were a little bit overwhelming. Um, we had some lengthy discussions uh, from section through two through five. It was more often than not that the word count was way over 400 words. And that's pretty unusual when you don't even have, a, you don't even say you are required to have 100 words or, you know, 200 words or whatever, what might be in the discussion. That wasn't the case. They were, after, from sections two through five, they were oftentimes over 400 words. So that is, uh, gives you some idea of what went on in the course. And I think it was quite successful. And I hope that if any of you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Any questions for yep. Dr. Jenny? Yes. I've got a question. Um, hey, Dr. Jenny, it's Devin. Hi, Devin. Um, so I, I thought about you a lot during this uh, COVID-19 period. So what, what opportunities did you identify that might be things that you would incorporate in the program moving forward that you might not have otherwise done without COVID-19? Well, one of the things, I definitely think an icebreaker is a fun way to, to get to know each other. Even if you are going to have a face-to-face, -face, I think that the, the, the wheel decide kind of thing could be done in a playful way to kind of make it uh, more relaxing to learn some, some tough material. Um, I loved having guest speakers. I don't know that we've incorporated guest speakers before in a lot of different programs. I think more programs should have guest speakers. And you can ask Lamprini. Uh, we've already taken the Daylight HTML5 templates and created what we call course lift. So all of the MLD courses are being going through a course lift right now and getting branding. Um, we've given them an RSS feed that relates to, which it, you don't realize how hard that is to pull it out of the uh, library. Rusty, not, Rusty can speak to this. We had to learn how to do it. Uh, so that people that t say teach strategic management, they can have an RSS feed that's going to be very specific to that course. So the RSS feeds, uh, even doing the badging credentialing, I think that has been, there's a lot of things that we all learn from each other just in this group. And I know that this group will give us some positive feedback and some constructive criticism to uh, take, that we can apply to not just this, but to, all of the MLD and the new PhD program is blossoming, so. Actually, more programs across the board. When we did that, I said, you know, Jenny, I want a cor uh, course lift across MLD. And she said, it's a lot of work. And I said, we will do it. And I knew that the faculty had so many things on their plates, but I think that we had to do it. And actually, we're almost done with all the courses. And I'm teaching these courses for 10 years. No, for 14 years, I'm older, I guess, uh, 14 years at St. Mary's. And right now I have total, it was eye-opening for my courses to add these templates, to add more videos, to add RSS. And it's more efficient. Instead of uh, spending time on one-to-one -one basis, a lot of information is there, information that I will not repeat. So I think that would be a great, um, take uh, for the rest of the programs for the rest of the of the departments in the college. Okay, so what I would like to do now, first of all, to apologize, uh, but for the time, but as you can see, there is so much passion uh, about what they have done, and it's very difficult to fit everything within eight minutes. So maybe we should, it was my mistake, we had to or at least for the future, I will know to put more time on the schedule uh, for the students. But I would like to ask President King, Dottie King, to share with us uh, her reflection, her thoughts 
about what she um, saw today here, watch the presentations, because uh, it was her idea. And uh, it was one and a half years ago when uh, she said, Lamprini, I have that idea about the certificate in women's leadership. Do you think that you can explore that? And I thought that was a great idea. And today I feel so, so beautifully to, to have to see that result of that dream of Dodis. Well, I feel overwhelmed, everyone. I've listened uh, intently to both the presentations and the questions, and um, it's been really, I've been blessed by the afternoon. Uh, in your stories, I have found myself uh, as, you know, a young woman um, in an academic uh, setting and making my way through right, right to now, where I'm no longer a young woman, um, and still find myself often surrounded um, in a room where my voice isn't the loudest voice and um, just navigating how to, how to speak up and make, make myself heard. And, and so it, the, the challenge is real. I wanna thank um, both Lamprini and Jenny. They, I consider both of them friends, but I also consider them to be um, strong female leaders and rock stars for the woods. So thank you for, for your uh, part in making this a reality. I really can't wait to see how it grows. Um, I also wanna add my thanks to others who have joined and collaborated. So to um, Dan, Eric, and Emily, thank you for your part. And Vicki and Joe, our guest speakers, it sounds like it's just been an extraordinary experience and our um, students, um, have been really telling in how much they had to say. They had a lot to say, and I imagine if we could have given them 30 minutes, they would have not had any trouble filling that. Uh, to the students, some of you I know, and I'm blessed to see you in, in this format, and some of you I don't know yet. I, I really look forward to knowing you, so I hope we have that opportunity, and I just want you to, um, take what you've gained from this experience and apply it to your life and know that St. Mary of the Woods is a deep place, it's a welcoming place, and no matter what, what brings you to the woods, you're always a part of it once you've been a part, so you're welcome to come physically. I would love to talk to you if there's anything I can do for you, and just congratulations to all of you. It was really an awesome afternoon for me. Thank you, Dodie. So uh, I know that you're so excited about uh, the certi certificates themselves, and you're waiting for um, Dr. Clark to present them. But before we move forward with this, I would like to ask our two guest speakers uh, just for a short reflection on their um, role to this program. And I would like to personally thank uh, Dr. Vicki Gordon and Dr. Joel Bano so I would like you first, Vicky, Dr. Gordon, to give us few remarks um, regarding your present, your present presence to this program and your participation. I, I, it's been so exciting and energizing, and uh, you know, I, you know, it's just it's 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 renewed my spirit. Um, in a time that I think we're all very, very challenged to think about what a difference each voice in the room can make. And um, it's just very exciting. I've learned so much through the poster session. I learned so much through being with you. And, and um, you know, it's, it's also, um, it gives me renewed hope for the future, especially when I hear um, all of the different things and, um, and these very extraordinary um, people in this program, including the facilitators and the instructors. And, you know, it's, it's um, you know, um, it just shows what the difference that we can make when we have confidence in ourselves and advocate for ourselves and support each other. So, Thank you for the privilege of being a part of it. 
Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Joe Albano? Wow. Um, all right, let me start with something completely superficial and say that the picture that you see on the screen actually <laughs> is of me. Uh, I don't know what happened between now and then, but... Love it. <laughs> For all of us. That's, yeah, uh, well, it, it, apparently it hit some of us harder than others. Um, <laughs> uh, on a more serious note, this is a leadership program that is not like anything that I've seen before. Mm -hmm. And I think it is absolutely critical, not just for women, but for anyone in leadership to understand the dynamics of individuals and how we bring ourselves to work. Uh, it's mm -hmm. been a, a subject of research for mine, and it's been a subject of my own experience. Um, you know, I don't want to create any kind of, of false equivalency, but as a man in the workplace who brings a different perspective than is usually expected from men, because uh, I do have an analytical background, but I also am really interested in the human dynamics, I've experienced that invisibility and that not having a voice too. Again, not trying to say that it's any kind of equivalent. But to deal with those issues, to have conversations and have self-discovery moments around those kinds of issues is what we need in the work, we, what we've always needed in the workplace and what we need now more than ever because the nature of the workplace is changing in ways that it hasn't in 125 or 150 years. So the, the thought that I'd leave you all with is as critical as you think this work is, it is even more critical. The work that you are doing as participants in this program as, and, as, and as stewards of this program is absolutely essential to our well-being as a species. Thank you very much, Dr. Albano. Thank you. So now I will invite Dr. Janet Clark, because everyone is waiting for you, Janet. Well, I get to do the fun part, I guess. Mm -hmm. But um, also, the I get to you know echo everyone's comments. It's always the hardest being the last, because I feel like everybody already said all the great things. But so I just want to echo um, everyone and their thanks to the team that put this program together uh, dan eric emily jenny and lamprini you just knocked it out of the ballpark it's really exciting to see it i mean i know i have a rock star team but you you just really um made something really special and different and really appreciate that and vicky and joe you know thank you for your um uh, you know, coming in and giving those seminars and then coming back tonight and reflecting and hearing, um, being here to hear the students give their final products. Thank you for that. That's great. Um, we, you know, at St. Mary of the Woods College, we have nearly 180 years of educating women and the legacy of women and their leadership and our Master of Leadership Development Program. It was just natural that President Keene came up with that idea and said we should continue this with our legacy of educating women and starting the certificate. And so um, it's exciting for us to do this. And in the words of Lamprini, who developed a program that provides the tools for women to find their voice, own the room, and determine their destiny. So that's what we know you're gonna be doing after tonight. So let's just get to that, that part. So, um, we have certificates prepared for all of you, your certificate of completion. It's ready to go in its lovely blue holder. So you can pick those up. We'll be mailing them to you. Normally I would read your name, Dottie King would hand it to you. And in this um, world of COVID, this is how we do it tonight. So first I'm gonna read everyone's name. You can give a little wave when it's your turn and, and give us a big smile as you would if you were standing on that stage. So first we have, um, I think I got the right one, Pamela Chamberlain. Thank you very much. It's 
been a blessing. Next is Shelby Coleman. I don't know, do they look backwards to you? Hopefully they look pretty normal. They look backwards to me. <laughs> they look good. Good. Next is Jennifer Matthews. Congratulations. <laughs> Christina Pearson. And lastly, Catherine Shima. So congratulations to all of you. I think it was, as Joe said, um, you know, today's world is in so much turmoil and the need for leaders to rise up and make a difference in this world is, is um, needed more than ever. And so after tonight, we now know that you're equipped to be leaders. You have that self-awareness. It's so exciting. And um, it's aligned with our mission here at St. Mary of the Woods College. You are critical thinkers, lifelong learners for sure, and um, hopefully agents um, affecting a positive change in our, in our society. And so we also know that you're gonna uh, demonstrate, you will always demonstrate a commitment to our values here at the college. Those are excellent community, diversity, integrity, knowledge and justice. I heard all of those tonight in your presentations. So accept our congratulations again on your achievement, and be proud of your accomplishment, and we look forward to hearing about your successes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Janet. So some- Congratulations to all. Yes, Thank to all for everybody. Them. Yes. <laughs> so somewhere here, I think we will complete this session tonight. So you will have time to go and celebrate with your families and with your loved ones. I'm very proud. I believe the rest of the facilitators